Okay, okay. I know it's the oldest and most contrived situation imaginable, but it happened. I wish I could tell you in some sophisticated or unusual way that I found out my wife was cheating on me, but I can't. It happened like an old cliche of a bad story. I work for an automotive parts manufacturer. I make brakes. Someone has to do it, and I'm one of the lucky ones. From four to midnight every day, five days a week, for eight hours, I operate one of the most archaic machines you've ever seen. I wear eye protection, earplugs, steel-toed shoes, and a denim apron. Every day I meet my quota, and if I'm lucky, I get a bonus at the end of the year. I have a nice three-bedroom house, a beautiful wife and two children, both in elementary school. After 12 years of marriage, things were going well, until today. We have five stations that mount the shoes. They all run on compressed air. In eight years, we have had no problems with the equipment. Today, in the middle of a shift, the compressed air system froze. The air used to run all our machines has to be perfectly dry. It is filtered and dehydrated by automatic equipment that never fails. Well, almost never. Tonight, the dehydrator system did not vent the accumulated moisture. I'm no scientist, so all I know is that when moisture and high-pressure air meet, freezing occurs and everything comes to a complete stop. Instead of having us sit out, they sent the whole crew home, without pay, of course. You could say my whole life was ruined by high humidity. When I opened the bedroom door, all I saw was a big, hairy back, bouncing up and down on my wife, Marcy. Of course, I instinctively turned on the overhead light when I realized that Marcy was not sleeping. Damn it, Danny, what the hell are you doing home? I expected her to freak out, apologize, and be embarrassed, but all I got was a pissed-off bitch. What the hell is going on? Oh, don't be such an idiot. You know perfectly well what's going on. I'm sorry you had to see it, but if you had come home when you were supposed to, it would never have happened. Would he never have been here? Or would I never have seen him? The hairy back had turned around and was now looking at me with a smirk. Marcy pulled up the sheets in a half-hearted attempt at modesty. My big mistake was grabbing the guy. When he got off the bed, he was much bigger than when he was lying down. For my foolish enthusiasm, I was rewarded with two very, very hard punches to the ribs. I didn't get to punch him and lay on the floor, trying like hell to catch my breath. I'm not sure, but I think at that point I took a blow to the head that knocked me unconscious. Somehow or other, I found myself in the hospital emergency room, where some sort of medical technician was bandaging my ribs. Marcy was sitting in the chair next to the exam table looking disgusted. The tech finished and left the room. Marcy, who the hell was that guy and what was he doing in our house? His name is Tony. He's a friend of mine and I invited him home. You were fucking him. You were banging him in our bed. Our kids were sleeping down the hall. Yes, I know. If you hadn't made such a fuss, they never would have woken up. I had to have my sister watch them so I could bring you here. What the hell was he doing there? How many times are you going to ask the same question? We were having sex. We were fornicating. Is that so hard to understand? Is this a regular occurrence? Or has this been the only time? Tony and I have been together for about six months. We were trying to keep it a secret. We don't usually come home, but I couldn't get a babysitter. Are you done yet? No, it's not over. Danny, you're a good father and a good husband, but Tony is great in bed. I don't see any reason for us to break up just because he's out in the open. I promise we'll never see each other at home again. It's not fair to you or the kids. I'm sorry, Marcy. That is not acceptable. It stops now. Danny, if you try to stop my relationship with Tony in any way, I can guarantee you'll regret it. You just got your ass kicked and Tony didn't even break a sweat. I can assure you it will happen again. If you do or say anything, everyone we know will find out that your wife is screwing another man and you're too much of a wimp to stop it. All our friends and neighbors will find out first. I'll see to it that your family finds out what a pathetic loser you are. The guys you work with will start calling you a cuckold. Think twice, Danny. Your life will be hell. I bet even your kids will be ashamed of you. Don't you care what they think of you? Would you make yourself look like a whore just to put me down? I'll do it if I have to, but I bet you won't take that chance. Tony thinks you're a coward and I think he's right. You're going to have to learn to live with it, Danny boy. Who the hell is this guy? Where does he work? He doesn't work, Danny. He owns Continental Classics, the luxury car emporium on Lancaster Pike. You know, the place you always wanted to get into but never did. That's it? Danny, he's richer than you, he's smarter than you, and he's better in bed than you. He also looks like he's stronger and better with his fists than you. Why don't you marry him if he's so great? That's why I keep you close, honey. Tony doesn't like kids. 
and I have no intention of giving up mine so I can be with him. You play housewife and daddy, while Tony gets all the love. Why is that so hard for you to understand? Am I supposed to like this arrangement? You don't have a choice. Either you live with it, or the whole world will find out what a loser you are. By the way, I'm going to move all your stuff into the guest room. I don't think it will be necessary for us to share a bed anymore, since the cat's out of the bag. I watched as Marcy got up to leave. I was glad to see her go. Just out of curiosity, honey, who was watching the kids when you were with Tony? Karen usually took care of them, but from time to time she would drop them off at your parents' house. By the way, Karen was the one who introduced me to Tony. I made a mental note to thank Karen as Marcy left the room. I was released the next morning. Marcy was not there. I had the choice of calling someone or taking a cab. The cab won. The kids were at school and Marcy wasn't home. All my clothes and personal items were piled on the guest bed. I'm sure Todd and Terry would have questions about the arrangements. I was going to let Marcy explain. It took me less than an hour to get my new living quarters in order. All kinds of ideas were going through my head in the meantime. There was no way this was going to go the way Marcy had planned. The first thing I did was to go to the basement and get out my old telephone recorder. It only worked with the landline, but I had no choice. Marcy used her cell phone for most of her calls. It only took me 20 minutes to plug it in and hide it behind some old paint cans. It was a first step. I felt terrible, but well enough to go back to work. They gave me some pain pills, but I wasn't thrilled with the idea of taking them and then driving machinery. I took a couple of high-potency Tylenols instead. One thing Marcy had really miscalculated was my relationship with the guys I worked with. I told them everything that had happened the night before. They all had ideas, some good and some bad. It felt good to know that friends would be there for you when you needed them. We had an eight-hour shift about to start, and each of us was going to spend it thinking of ways to fix things. We stopped for dinner in the middle of the shift. Okay, has anyone come up with any ideas? Glenn was the first to speak. I have no idea, but I have a cousin who works for the son of a bitch. He handles all the details of the vehicles. As far as I know, he hates DeMarco. If you need information about the business, the buildings, or the work shifts, he can help you. That will definitely be a help, Glenn. Anyone else? Danny, I have two shotguns and two pistols. You're welcome to either one. Neither is registered, so don't worry. Thanks, Barry, but that sounds a little more drastic than I expected. Well, hell. Then you don't even want to listen to my idea. There was a small chuckle at Freddy's comment. Tell us, Freddy. Come on, tell us. I thought we could tie him to a tree with his legs spread and build a fire, Indian style, between his legs. Everyone loved Freddy's idea, but it was unanimously rejected. Kyle was the only one who hadn't offered anything, so we all just watched him as we ate our lunches. What? Don't look at me like that. Yes, I have an idea, but it's a little flaky. Spit it out, Kyle. I remember reading somewhere about a prison in Arizona that dressed all the pedophiles and pedophiles in pink jumpsuits. It was supposed to be humiliating. I know this Tony guy is not a pedophile, but something like that would embarrass the hell out of him. You mean put a pink jumpsuit on him? Wouldn't he take it off? I was thinking if you could get in there, tie it up, and then spray it all with pink paint. That might do the trick. But he would know who did it. First, you have to knock him unconscious and then leave him tied to the chair until they find him. How? Do we do it with drugs or do we hit him over the head? What do you have in mind? I can get a taser. All you have to do is sneak up on it and shoot it. You make it sound easier than it probably is. How do we get him when he's alone? And how do we get close enough without him knowing? I don't have all the answers. I just thought it was an idea. The doorbell rings and I'm back for another four hours on the machines. My quota for the night was low, so the other guys chipped in to match it. Marcy was in bed when I got home. At least she was keeping her word not to bring the asshole home. I had no idea what I was going to do. Most of the things the guys and I talked about were like high school pranks. I might as well put a flaming bag of dog poop on his door. I needed real revenge. It was noon when I got up. The kids were at school and I could hear Marcy moving around the house. I took a quick shower, shaved, and headed out the door. Good morning, husband. Don't you have a kiss for your wife? I was standing by the sink, hand on my hip and a smirk on my face. I turned and walked out the door. His smart-ass comment didn't merit a response. I needed to eat and spend some time alone. I spent the rest of the afternoon killing time. I was trying to figure out what I could do to my wife's sex partner without causing too much havoc for myself. I had to finish work tonight and start getting ready. I decided to stop eating at home. It was the only time I spent with the boys, but I could no longer force myself to eat what Marcy cooked. Before I knew it, it was time for work. Things were pretty normal until dinner time. 
Danny, I have the taser in the car. I don't know if you'll be able to use it for anything, but at least you can have it for self-protection. Kyle looked proud of himself. Don't forget to pick it up before you go home. Did you ever use the damn thing? No. We can try it. Who wants to volunteer? The only response was a chorus of groans around the table. No one had any new ideas, but everyone was willing to support anything I came up with. I felt better knowing I had some friends. Things were normal at home when I arrived. It would be a short night for me. Working the night shift disrupts sleep habits, especially on weekends. I was up earlier than usual. Todd and Terry jumped at the chance to spend some time at Chuck E. Cheese. Marcy didn't seem to mind at all, especially when I told her we would be gone all day. Danny, I'm going to need you to take some vacation time next week. Tony's friend Wally is coming up from Detroit, and we're going on a three-night, four-day cruise to Cancun. If you can't make it, could you see if your parents can? Let me get this straight. You're going on a sea cruise with two guys? That sounds a little sleazy, even for you. Don't be rude, Danny. It doesn't suit you. Wally will be staying with Karen. They've been old friends for a couple of years. Oh, well, gee, I guess that makes it all good then. I tried to be as sarcastic as possible. I would definitely thank Karen later. Of course, I started the day too early. To kill some time before Chucky's opened, we went to Hobby Lobby close to home. The kids were old enough to put together most of the plastic models that lined the shelves. The end results were nothing earth-shattering, but they had a lot of fun. I let them explore the hundreds of boxes and wandered around marveling at all the junk that was available for creative housewives. I guess if Marcy had liked crafts, she wouldn't have brought home that furry gorilla. It was too late now. My eyes lit up when I discovered rows and rows of designer paint and spray cans. There they were. Six beautiful pink spray paint cans. They didn't have as much paint as the ones from Lou's or Home Depot, but they were pink. It was the only place I ever saw paint that color, in an aerosol can. Of course, I took this as a sign and bought all six cans. Todd ended up with a monster truck kit, and Terry opted for the tow truck. I didn't even know they made plastic tug models. Before we left, I also bought a package of 10 plastic cable wraps. They were about 18 inches long and looked like they would do the job. By then, Chuck E. Cheese was ready for business. The guys killed about four hours and two pizzas before burning out. We picked up a package of cheap bread and went to Pandora Park. The ducks ate it all in the first 10 minutes, but we hung around for another couple of hours before heading to my parents' house. Mom and Dad were glad to have us for dinner and to spend the evening. Todd and Terry spent most of the evening in front of the TV, and I took advantage of the time to fill Dad in on the situation with Marcy. I realized that I was telling him what was going on before Marcy could. She was threatening to do the same thing I was doing. Heck, that almost made her threat worthless. Dad promised they would be there to take care of the kids no matter what. That would make things a lot easier to carry out. I didn't want the boys to get hurt by the situation. Around 9 o'clock, I called Marcy to let her know that we would be spending the night at my parents' house. I picked up the machine. After a big breakfast at IHOP, we arrived home to find Marcy still in bed. I immediately fired up the mower and started in the back, next to the bedrooms. Todd and Terry were anxious to get started on their models, even though it was a beautiful day outside. I let them go. I decided to work all day on the lawn. There was edging to trim and pruning to do. Things didn't go as fast as usual because I was stopping a lot to chat. I had a pair of perfectly good hedge cutters, but decided to borrow some from Mike Fielding, the neighbor across the street. His wife, Mary, was one of the biggest gossips in the neighborhood. I explained to Mike that there might be some unfamiliar cars parked next to the house because Marcy was having some male friends over. Everything should be fine, unless they got drunk and rowdy. If that happened, I would call the police. It was hard for me to control things since I worked at night. Larry Finley was on the board of directors of the local church. I borrowed a spark plug wrench from him and apologized for Marcy's recent wild behavior. Of course, I wanted to know what he meant. Larry was more nosy than Mary Fielding. Ten minutes later, I had enough fodder for a month. I didn't break for lunch and finished work around four in the afternoon. After a quick shower, I went to Rosie's Cantina and ordered the most expensive meal on the menu. I'm not sure what it was, but it sure was good. I spent the rest of the afternoon with my brother Dave and his family. Dad had already told him what was going on. I spent the night on his couch. My wife had a great plan. She was going to force me to obey by threatening to find out I was a cuckold. If I refused to consent and support her infidelity, she would make my life miserable. It was an interesting idea, but it had a lot of holes in it. In less than a week, I had told everyone what was going on. That nullified her threat. I was also able to make her look like more of a slut than I had ever imagined. 
I don't think she expected any reaction. I stopped by the house the next afternoon to change for work, and a fuming Marcy was waiting for me. What the hell have you been telling the neighbors? Karen said you told everyone that I ran a whorehouse here at night. Oh, shit. That's not true, Marcy. I simply explained to them that you might be entertaining men while I was at work and that they shouldn't get excited about it. Well, that's not the way it goes around. Who else have you been talking to? To everyone. I thought I'd tell them before you. It seemed easier that way. I didn't say anything to your parents or your sisters. You should probably do it before they hear the rumors. Damn it, Danny. You're making me look like a whore. Well, fair enough. You were going to make me look like a cuckold. Bastard. I'm sorry, honey, but I have to go to work. I was able to spend some time with the kids before I left. The hardest part was not being able to spend the quality time I wanted to spend with them. Glenn had the best news of the night. Continental Classics closed at 9 o'clock Thursday night, so Tony could personally do all the payroll for Friday. He hated to be disturbed while doing payroll, so even the cleaning crew was gone. Kyle took a few minutes and showed me how to use the taser. No one volunteered to try it out. The plan was coming together. If I got caught, and I expected to, I'd be facing jail time. I didn't give a shit. Tony DeMarco had to be humiliated. If I was arrested, I'd make sure every newspaper and TV station had the whole story. Any publicity like that would crush him, or at least make him so mad he'd do something dumb. The next few days, I only went home to sleep, shower, and change clothes. I hadn't eaten at home since the first day. Thursday finally came. I managed to get my truck to run out of battery, so Kyle picked me up. The plant supervisor never bothered the brake guys too much. As long as we met our quotas and the quality was good, they left us alone. One thing I favored was the OSHA requirements for the job. Between the apron, gloves, and welding goggles, we all looked pretty much alike. At 8.30, I slipped out the back door. The guys would take turns working at my station. Of course, one of their positions would be vacant, but no one cared. Bathroom breaks were routine and never monitored. The main thing was to give the illusion that I was never leaving. I entered the employee door at Continental Classics and headed straight for the restroom. At about 9 o'clock, someone did a quick check before turning off the lights. Ten minutes later, I slipped on some latex gloves and stepped out of the restroom into a semi-dark office area. His desk faced the display area, so his back was to the door. It looked like it was going to be easier than I expected. He had a computer in front of him, but he was pecking away at an old adding machine with paper tape. He didn't hear me approach. I hit Tony with the taser right in the back of the head. His body jerked up and I thought he was going to roll over, so I hit him again. This time, he gave a couple of jerks and then relaxed. Perfect. I put two plastic bandages on each leg and two on each arm. I brought an old tie to blindfold him. He was being very cooperative. I pulled the chair up to the glass window of the showroom. They would see it perfectly when his people showed up for work in the morning. It was a nice pink color, but I had to use a lot more than intended. The clothes absorbed the paint as fast as I sprayed it. It took at least three coats in each area to get it to look the way I wanted it to. I had enough paint, but just barely. It looked very pretty in pink. When I finished, I carefully repacked everything. I hoped Tony would wake up while I was decorating him, but he didn't move. I had also planned to remove the bandage from his neck before I left. I looked at the clock several times. I was within the time frame I had set for myself, but I still wanted Tony to wake up before I left. Five minutes later, I was starting to worry. I tried to check his pulse to no avail. Maybe I couldn't feel it because of the latex gloves. I took off a glove and tried again. There was still no pulse. I tried to find a pulse in his neck like I saw them do on TV. I still couldn't find anything. I removed the bandage and touched his eyeball with the tip of a pencil. He didn't blink. There was no reflex of any kind. Needless to say, I panicked. I had the presence of mind to put the latex glove back on and clean up anything I might have touched. I tucked the tie in my pocket and then cut all the plastic ties. You could see the marks the pink paint had left when I removed them. It looked strange. The white fur under the tie made it look like a pink raccoon. I took another minute to make sure I hadn't missed anything, and then went to work. I threw all the junk I had on me, including the taser, into a culvert on the way to the shop. Ten minutes later, I was back making brake shoot. No one noticed my absence. As soon as the shift was over, I told the guys what had happened. They were all props so I was pretty sure no one would say anything. Freddy was very impressed. None of them seemed concerned. Kyle drove me home, and we both made a mental note of what time he dropped me off. I didn't get as much sleep as usual. At about 10 o'clock, Marcy burst into my room. What the hell did you do? What did you do, you little bastard? Of course, I turned around and looked at her, perplexed. What the hell are you talking about, woman? 
Tony is dead. Karen called and said they found him in his office this morning. Dead. I think you had something to do with it, and I'll see that you pay for it, you bastard. It was the second time he had called me a bastard in five minutes. It was clear I wasn't going to sleep anymore, so I stumbled out of bed and went to the bathroom. I was in no hurry to face the Wicked Witch of the East, so I took a long, hot shower and shaved slowly. I even slathered on some aftershave just to tease my doting wife. I never made it to the coffee pot. A tall black man was standing in the living room talking to Marcy. He had very short hair and was wearing a dark suit. The bitch had called the police. There was no doubt about it. I shook my head and headed to the kitchen for my first cup of the day. Marcy had a sarcastic little smile on her face as I sat down in my favorite recliner. My uninvited guest sat down when I did. Mr. Mercer, my name is Detective Darnell Green, with an E. I'm here about the death of Anthony DeMarco last night. Your wife indicated that you and Mr. DeMarco had a disagreement last week, and I was wondering if I could ask you a few questions. Sure, I have no objections, but not here. What do you mean? If you want to talk, let's do it in your office, not my house. Is that okay with you? I couldn't help but notice the frown that appeared on Marcy's face. I was pretty sure she had expected to be included in the discussion. My car or yours, Mr. Mercer? I have other things to do, so I'll see you there. Any special offices? Second floor at the rear. Room 206. Turn right when you exit the elevator. I'll see you shortly. Marcy was fuming as I put on my shoes. I didn't get to finish my coffee, so I dumped it in the sink. I turned and smiled as I walked out the door. I guess you're going to get what you wanted, honey. What are you talking about? What the hell do you mean, Danny? Ten minutes later, he was sitting with Detective Green on the second floor of the municipal building. For the next hour, Detective Green asked all the right questions, and I got all the right answers. I was trying to be discreet about it without ignoring it or rubbing it in my face. Of course, I had to admit that I had a motive, but never had the opportunity to do anything about it. It was a serious situation, but I did my best to be sympathetic without being a smartass. I think he appreciated the fact that I made his job easier, even if I didn't have an answer for it. The most interesting part of the discussion was finding out that Tony died of some sort of heart problem. He had a pacemaker installed a couple of years ago, and I guess it didn't go very well with the taser. Of course, they knew about the taser because of the marks on his neck. I felt bad about Tony's death, but I was also glad. Detective Green gave me the usual don't leave town speech and told me he would get back to me after verifying my alibi. Wow. I never thought I would need an alibi for anything. It was exciting. We parted on good terms. I had a feeling that Darnell Green was on my side. He made me feel warm all over. I grabbed a bite to eat and watched the news. There was a segment about the death of a local businessman. It mentioned that there were no known relatives in the area. I emptied the bank accounts and then had a hearty breakfast. There were things to do at home. Marcy wasn't there when I got back. It took me 30 minutes to get all my stuff into the master bedroom and all of Marcy's stuff into the guest room. The guest room had a small closet and a dresser. I stacked everything on the bed for her to put away. I checked the phone recorder in the basement, and there was nothing important. I gathered up all the bank and insurance records and other important papers. I was glad to have Marcy's Volvo in my name. That would make things easier. I stuffed everything into a folder under the front seat of my truck. I called work and took a two-week vacation. A few hours later, my beloved wife showed up. She seemed surprised to find me home. It was time to get things back in order. I smiled as I led her to the guest room. What the hell is this? Who the hell do you think you are? His response was a big smile. Answer me, damn it. What's going on? Marcy, I will be staying in the master bedroom from now on. You can stay in the guest room. I suggest you start putting your clothes away. Anything not in the closet or on the dresser by dinner time will be discarded. Any questions? I can't fit my stuff in that little closet, and I don't intend to stay in that room anyway. What the hell do you mean dispose of? If you can't fit it in the closet or dresser, you don't need it. This is not going to happen, Danny. I don't know what kind of game you think you're playing, but it won't work. You're dead meat. I suggest you start putting things in order. If you have any more questions, I'll come back later. Bastard. It was the third time today that he called me a bastard. I must be doing something right. While Marcy was busy in the guest room, I left her purse on the kitchen table. I took my time to gather everything I wanted. First, I took her cell phone and then her car keys. From her wallet, I took out her driver's license and all the credit cards, debit cards, and money. I put everything that was left back into storage. I took the title to his car out of the van and drove the Volvo across town to a friend who owned a dealership. I sold it to him directly, at a good price, with the agreement that I would wholesale it out of town. Even with the payment, I took a few thousand dollars in my pocket. 
I was walking into Taco Bell to eat when my cell phone rang. You son of a bitch! What did you do with my phone and where the hell is my car? I was glad he wasn't calling me a cunt again. He was calling from the home phone. It was a good test. I could check the recorder when I got home. I'm sorry, honey. I had to get money to hire a lawyer to defend me against the murder charges. I promise to get you another car as soon as I get out of jail. He was still insulting me when I hung up and turned off my cell phone. After that conversation, I decided that a lawyer would be a good idea. Whatever happened, I wasn't going to stay married, but I would have to wait because I was the next one to ask. Todd and Terry were home when I arrived. I went straight to my kids and ignored Marcy. I glanced at her a couple of times and could tell she wasn't very happy. The boys were anxious to show me the models they had assembled. When Marcy started preparing dinner, I headed to the guest room. All my clothes were on the bed. All of Marcy's clothes were in the master bedroom. I chuckled to myself but decided not to resist. She was tough and determined at this point. Marcy told the boys to wash up for dinner, and I went to the guest room to put my stuff away again. I would have loved to throw all their stuff away, but it seemed too childish. Tonight, I indulged myself at Red Lobster. Money was no problem, because I still had cash left after giving a deposit to the divorce lawyer. The shrimp and lobster combo was great, but the cheese rolls were still my favorite. When I finished eating, I turned my cell phone back on. I was hoping for a call from one of the guys at work or Detective Green. No luck, as the first call was from my wife. Danny, how am I supposed to go to the grocery store? We need milk and a few other things. I'll take you when I get home. Try to get groceries on Saturdays when I don't work. I'll feel better if you don't do the shopping by yourself. Oh, I have another call. I've got to go. I'll talk to you when I get home. The second call was from Kyle. Detective Green spoke to the entire team, individually and as a group. All the stories held up. Tom Tingle, the floor manager, was the most supportive. He insisted that it was impossible for me to have missed work. He monitored all his men very closely and could guarantee that I had been there all night. I knew he wasn't that smart. If some criminal investigator wanted to prove that I killed Tony DeMarco, I'm sure he could do it. I had a feeling that no one cared. I got home just in time to put the kids to bed. Marcy was sitting on the couch with a glass of wine. I grabbed a cold Foster's from the fridge and made myself comfortable in my recliner. The TV wasn't on, so I figured it was a good time for Marcy and I to talk. So Marcy, how's the plan to turn me into a wimp and a cuckold going? Well, that ended the conversation before it started. He finished his wine, got up, and went to his room. I thought he wanted to talk. I guess I was wrong. I grabbed my beer and went to check the recorder. The first call was to his sister. There was no cover up there. It seemed that Marge knew all about the affair with Tony and was supporting Marcy in every way. That was good to know. The next call was to Marcy's mother, and it was a little different. Mom had no idea what was going on. Her daughter convinced her that Tony was Karen's friend and that I was jealous because I had been trying to have sex with Karen for years. Tony lectured me about it, and I got angry. He never said I had killed him, but I'm sure he inferred it. He called the cell phone company to see if he could get them to replace the phone he had taken from me and was unsuccessful. He then called traffic to report that I had taken his driver's license. He was told to report it to the police. She called the bank to ask for a replacement credit card, but was told the account was closed. I must say she was a very busy girl. The last call on the answering machine was to Karen. Karen lived a few houses away, so I have no idea why they used the phone instead of meeting. Of course, it was for my benefit. I learned two important things from that call. Wally was still coming from Detroit, and that Marcy was going to lay low until he arrived. The boys and I got up early the next morning. We left the house before Marcy woke up. We got home after lunch, and Marcy insisted that I drive her to the grocery store. She needed things. And since she no longer had a car or a driver's license, I had to take care of it. That night, while she prepared dinner, I checked the tape recorder. Wally had arrived, and the first person he called was Marcy. It was an interesting conversation. He believed everything Marcy told him and vowed revenge. Wally and Tony grew up together, and he wouldn't let this go. He gave Marcy the number where he was staying and told her to call him the next day when she had a chance. Marcy immediately called Karen and excitedly told her how happy she was. She couldn't believe that this was the woman he had been married to all these. The change was so sudden and so complete. I had no idea that what she had done was so bad as to deserve this, other than killing her lover. I went out for a hamburger before bed. Of course, the lawn needed to be mowed again. So the next day, I had a good excuse to avoid Marcy. Around 11 o'clock, Marcy's mother and father came to pick up the kids. I had no idea that a sleepover with the in-laws was planned, but I decided not to protest. Tomorrow was a school day, 
and Grandma Wilcox promised they would be on time. I was anxious to check the phone recorder, but lunch came first, as I had missed breakfast. After a quick shower, I went to Denny's. Marcy never said anything about the fact that I no longer ate at home. Marcy and Wally had set up a plan to avenge Tony's death. It was all a bit comical. I guess it wouldn't have seemed so if I didn't know what was going on. After Marcy and I went to bed, Wally was going to enter the house through the sliding door on the back porch. She promised him it would be open. If everything went according to plan, it would look like I had been shot during an attempted burglary. Marcy and Karen would call 911 when they heard the gunshot. I know it sounds stupid, but at that moment I remembered that I hadn't changed the beneficiaries on my insurance policies. I blew a sarcastic kiss to my wife on my way out the door and received a finger in response. I had dinner with my parents and spent the evening there. Before I left, I borrowed Dad's snake charmer. The short-barreled 20-gauge would be perfect for the evening party. Marcy was in bed when I got home, but she had the light on and I assumed she was reading. The only call on the recorder was from Karen. She was bragging about the good sex she and Wally had had all afternoon. Before she said goodbye, she promised Marcy that she would be ready later that night. It took me about 20 minutes to replace the buckshot in the cartridges with rock salt. I had a bag full from last winter. I didn't want to kill Wally, but just slow him down. Hell, I didn't want to kill Tony either. I hoped Wally didn't have a bad ticker like Tony. I wanted to check the door to the back porch, but I was afraid Wally would see me. I had to assume Marcy had left it open. I stripped down to my shorts and rummaged through the blankets on the bed. A cup of coffee would have been nice, but there wasn't any made, so I settled for a Coke. I waited in my recliner with my cell phone by my side. He didn't show up until after midnight. As soon as I saw him on the terrace, I called 911 and reported that there was an intruder in my house. I was careful to say that I feared for my life. I did not hang up the phone. The patio door opened quietly and there stood Wally. I waited until he was completely inside the house and gave him the first blast. I aimed for his lower body because I didn't want to accidentally kill the son of a bitch. The first shot sent him tumbling backwards onto the deck. When the second hit him, he fell over the side of the deck, breaking the railing. I knew I hadn't killed him because he howled like a stuck pig. The rock salt must have really hurt him. I was surprised at how loud the shotgun blast sounded inside the house. My ears were ringing like crazy. I turned on the lights, and within seconds Marcy was standing in the living room screaming. She was actually yelling words at me, but I couldn't understand them. I walked over to check on Wally and saw a Ruger 22 automatic with silencer on the floor. Marcy was still yelling, so I pointed the shotgun in his direction. She quickly shut up and ran out of the room. It looked like Wally had broken his ankle when he fell. Some guys have all the luck. Ten minutes later, the first black and white arrived. There wasn't much discussion. I had put the shotgun down so that there would be no misinterpretation of what was going on. I flagged down the phone and one of the officers informed the 911 operator that everything was under control. They asked who else was in the house and I told them about Marcy in the bedroom. They took her into the living room and discovered they had made a big mistake. Her mouth was running a mile a minute. I tried to cover her up while the police tried to shut her up. Neither of us succeeded. Finally, a uniformed policewoman took her by the arm and led her outside. I noticed Karen was out with other neighbors. I smiled at her and slowly ran my index finger down my throat. She turned and walked quickly away without returning my smile. The emergency unit arrived for Wally at the same time as Detective Green. He smiled when he saw me, and I smiled back with a big smile. I wasn't trying to be a smartass, but I couldn't help it. The Amazon cop took Marcy back to the house so she could get dressed. She had calmed down a bit. After dressing, we all headed back to police headquarters. I insisted on riding in separate cars, so Detective Green let me ride with him. We didn't talk during the ride, but he looked at me and smiled again. It was daylight when Green released me. We only talked for about 30 minutes, but they kept me all night. I felt like I was in Guantanamo because they kept making me drink coffee. One of the black and white cars took me home. I was a little disappointed because I expected to see yellow tape around the house. The place looked like nothing had happened. The rock salt didn't even break the glass siding door. I guess Wally got most of it. I figured it would take an hour to fix the broken railing. I threw myself into bed and didn't get up until after lunch. After emptying my bladder, I staggered out to the kitchen and found my friendly detective sitting at the table reading the newspaper and drinking freshly brewed coffee, which I assumed he had made while I slept. I had already had all the coffee I wanted the night before, so I settled for a large glass of orange juice and sat down across from him. I have no idea how he got into the house. You're a great guy, Mr. Mercer. He didn't look up from the paper. I didn't know how to respond to that, so I didn't say anything. I didn't know if he was playing with me or what. He finished his coffee. Detective Green, 
I need a shower, a shave, and something to eat. My treat, unless it's against some police policy. Take your time, Danny. I have all day. As I walked to the shower, I wondered when he slept. Lunch was two big pork sandwiches. Green even accompanied me with a beer. Neither of us said anything, and after a while, the silence became overwhelming. You're dying to ask me some questions, aren't you, Mr. Mercer? It's funny, but I was thinking the same thing about you. My detective friend beckoned the bartender over and ordered two more beers on tap. I spent all night asking you questions. Now it's your turn. Well, for starters, where's my wife? We are still holding her. She will be arraigned this afternoon. I finished my beer. Your wife's parents got her a lawyer. I wasn't expecting that. Now I had hundreds more questions. But the problem was that the more questions I asked, the more I risked exposing myself. I decided it was best to back off. It was good to see that Marcy's family was available to her because I wasn't going to be there. I have no further questions, Detective Green, but if you feel the need to vent, feel free to start anytime. He took a good gulp of beer and laughed. Not too loud, but a laugh. One more thing. You didn't overhear or perhaps record any conversation your wife had with Mr. Williams, did you? I assume you mean Wally? That caused me to grimace a little. If I happen to have such a tape, would you need it? I don't know yet. If things go the way I think they will, it won't make any difference, but if one of them gets a good lawyer, maybe. If I had a tape like that, wouldn't I get in trouble? You're right about that. I'm just trying to make my job easier. I'll see what I can do without having a tape that may or may not exist. I nodded with a small gesture of thanks. Danny boy, I think I should take you home. Your kids will be home from school soon, and they need their father. We arrived at the house just as the school bus was dropping off Todd and Terry. They approached us, and I introduced them to my new detective friend. They wanted to see his badge. It all seemed pleasant enough until Green leaned forward and said, Now, which one of you built the tugboat, and which one of you built the monster truck? I built the truck, Todd shouted, puffing out his chest. I made the tug. Do you want to see it? Terry was just as proud. Maybe I'll get a chance to see them next time. I have to go now. He left me standing there, dumbfounded, and walked to his car with a huge shit-eating grin on his face. The bastard knew about the pink paint. He had my balls in his hand, and I couldn't do anything about it. We ordered a pizza that night. The boys never asked where their mother was. After dinner, Marcy's father called and said he needed help raising the bail money to get her out of jail. I tried to be as polite as I could when I turned him down. I'm not sure he understood what was going on, but at least he was trying to be a good father. I asked him where he was going to stay. He hesitated a bit and then said he would stay with them. The boys and I loaded all of Marcy's things into the van and dropped them off. It didn't cost us anything to pick it all up. When we returned home, I saw a U-Haul truck in the driveway of Karen's house. The next morning it was gone. Marcy never called me. I had to read the newspaper every day to find out what was going on. No one told me anything. In fact, it was almost as if I was left out on purpose. There was no trial. Marcy put all the blame on Wally. Wally said it was all his idea. They both ended up pleading guilty. Marcy got three to five years for conspiracy to commit murder. Wally got five to ten years for attempted murder. The feds were called in because of the silencer Wally was wearing. They decided to wait until Wally finished his first sentence before bringing changes. Detective Green didn't need the tape and never mentioned it again. Karen disappeared and was never heard from again. My father was happy to get his shotgun back and promised me he would lend it to me again if I needed it. He was laughing when he said that. I had Marcy served with divorce papers as soon as her sentence began. She didn't protest at all. I got the feeling she didn't want to hear from me because I hadn't seen or talked to her since the night I shot Wally. I sold the house and moved back in with my parents. I couldn't work and take care of the kids by myself. The guys at work were happy to have me back. For some reason, they offered to switch me to the day shift but I turned it down. Every month I took the boys to the women's prison in Muncie to see their mother. I would wait in the car because they were usually there for less than an hour. Sometimes, when the weather was nice, the meetings were outdoors. I could park and watch them through the metal fence. I never asked them about visitors and asked them not to tell me anything. It seemed to work well for everyone. Things seemed to be going smoothly until I got the call. Hi, is this Daniel Mercer? Yes, my name is Angela Hawkins. A detective named Darnell Green said I should call you. There are things we need to discuss. I know, Detective Green, but why would you want to talk to me? Tony DeMarco was my brother. Oh, shit. Just when I thought all this shit was behind me, something like this has to happen. I don't think it's a good idea. I'm sorry for your loss, but I can't help you. I hung up the phone before he could say anything else. Two days later, he called back. Daniel, I would be very grateful if you would come to see me. 
There are some things I need to tell you. Detective Green said you were a reasonable man. Where did you want to meet? I'd prefer to do it in the car showroom, but anywhere you feel comfortable is fine with me. It took me a few moments to find something. Meet me Saturday morning at 10 o'clock at the showroom. I'll bring my two sons. They like to look at old cars. I didn't know what I had in mind, but I felt safer in a public place. With the kids. I wasn't using them as a shield or anything, but I thought she would be less likely to try anything if I had them with me. I had no idea what kind of grudge this woman might be harboring. If she was Tony's sister, she must be Italian. If she was Italian, she must be hot-blooded. If she was hot-blooded, she had to be careful. At this point, I decided I was overthinking the whole thing. I needed a beer. I called Detective Green and asked him what was going on. He laughed and told me to meet with her and stop worrying. That was easy for him to say since he hadn't killed his brother. Continental Classics was a large and impressive place. In addition to the main showroom, they had two large buildings in the back that contained cars needing restoration or waiting for a spot in the showroom. I was surprised when we stopped in to see that they were having a grand opening celebration. I was not expecting it. There was a lot I didn't understand. Terry and Todd seemed torn between the cars and the gifts. The first impression was the smell of the popcorn machine. A guy with floppy shoes and a rubber nose was handing out small bags of hot popcorn. Off to the side, there was a soda machine and another clown with a hot dog cart. The kids wouldn't need to eat today. It was not too difficult to recognize Angela Hawkins. I knew it right away, as soon as I saw her walk straight towards me with a slow, determined stride. Everything about her said Italian. Dark hair, dark eyes, olive complexion, and wide hips. I suppose a gentleman wouldn't have noticed her hips, but her height accentuated them. Five feet at the most. Tony was huge and his sister short and wide. I felt myself getting a little nervous as she got closer. And then I noticed the smaller clone next to her. The girl looked to be about ten years old and was the spitting image of Angela except that her hair was a little lighter, and naturally, she had no hips. It seemed that my hostess covered herself as well as I. We were a rather pitiful pair. We both used our children as security. As he closed the gap that separated us, his hand reached out in a friendly manner. Daniel Mercer, I presume. It was natural and polite to take his hand and shake it. I always wanted to say that, like in the movie about Dr. Livingstone. She smiled but seemed a little nervous, which made me feel a little better. I was kind of speechless, so she kept talking. This is my daughter, Carla. Carla smiled at the boys and me. Todd smiled back politely and said her name, but Terry held out his hand with a smile on his face. Carla, why don't you show the boys around the house while I talk to their father? Terry immediately followed Carla to the display area while Todd headed for the hot dog stand. I took that as a good sign. We can talk down here or upstairs in my office. Your choice? I guess the office would be fine. Those were the first words out of my mouth. As we walked toward the stairs leading to the elevated office, I noticed several of the employees glancing in my direction and making comments to each other. Angela also noticed and smiled at my discomfort. All of the vendors on the floor were wearing blue bowling shirts for the opening, so they were easy to spot. Unfortunately, they all seemed more interested in me than the buyers. One guy at the end of the building gave me a big smile and a thumbs up. I smiled back but felt a little nervous. Did Detective Green say anything to you about my situation? I didn't respond. I just shook my head no. I don't want to bore you with my life story, but I think you need to know a little bit. Tony was my brother and my only relative. There is no other family. When Tony died, he had no will. Since I was the only relative, I inherited his business. The executor took a good share, but I still got more than I expected. I was glad to see that someone was getting something beneficial out of the whole mess. As she explained things to me, I noticed that she was wearing an ear piercing and a wedding ring. A small silver cross hung from her neck, but it was hard to see it because my eyes kept wandering down her cleavage. I started to remember how long it had been since I had sex when she interrupted me. Mr. Mercer, are you paying attention? It was a trick question. He was smiling when he asked it. I'm sorry. I was just admiring your crucifix. She was telling me to just look her in the eye and pay attention when she punched me in the arm. Would you like a beer? It would be a good idea. There was a mini fridge next to the desk, and she had to bend down to get the drinks. One moment I was compelled to look at her cleavage, and the next I knew she had a beautiful ass staring me in the face. She wasn't explaining things to me. She was just trying to seduce me. Maybe it wasn't intentional, but it was working wonders. He opened the tab and handed me the can, careful not to bend over. We had a few drinks each without saying anything. Well, Mrs. Hawkins, I'm glad it went well for you, but I'm not sure why I'm here. I should get back to the boys before they start worrying. 
It would be better if you called me Angela. Can I call you Danny? Of course. Are we done here? No, damn it. Sit there and stay still until I'm done. Detective Green said you'd understand. I did not answer. If I kept my mouth shut, it would end sooner. Tony was a bastard. He wasn't a good son of a bitch and deserved to die. Oddly enough, I wanted to thank you. It was a trap. That damn detective was setting me up. Was the room bugged or was she? She might have a bug hidden in her bra. Damn, I was looking at her cleavage again. Do you carry a microphone or some kind of recording device? Of course not. Why would I do something like that? I finished my beer, though I still wasn't convinced. I'd better go down and see what the boys are up to. I wouldn't want them to get in trouble. Just sit down. She seemed quite convinced of this. There was no love lost between Tony and me. About three years ago, my husband was killed in an accident. He had no life insurance, and the guy who hit him had no insurance. I was out of work and had a daughter to raise. Tony was my only relative, so I asked him for help. He paid part of my husband's funeral expenses, and that was it. He wouldn't even return my calls. Are you telling me that his death was a good thing for you? Yes, and apparently for you too. Maybe we should both be grateful for what happened and leave it at that. Angela smiled and finished her beer. You don't want to talk about this anymore, do you? I nodded and started to get up from the chair. I need you to do me a favor. You're the only one who can help me. What could I do for you? I want you to come work for me as general manager. You're crazy. I don't know anything at all about the car business, especially luxury cars, like you have down there. I know that. I have people who take care of those things. What do you need me for? Angela seemed a little nervous. She looked at her feet and then at the walls. Her eyes darted back and forth as she tried to articulate a few words. Did you see how my people looked at you when you came up to the office with me? Yes, they weren't smiling. Everyone thinks you killed Tony. Not only did you kill him, but you made him a laughingstock. Everyone was afraid of Tony. Now they seem to be afraid of you. Their fear is akin to respect. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Don't they respect you? No. They're going to rip me off left and right, and there's not a damn thing I can do about it. I'm not smart enough or tough enough to keep them in line. What good could it do? For the most part, just being here. After a while, we'll both learn the business well enough to be able to control what happens. Until then, I need you to bully them. I'm a good guy, Angela. That's why Tony and my wife tried to take advantage of me. She seemed a little more comfortable now. That didn't work out too well for them, did it? For some strange reason, I found it funny and laughed a little. For the next 30 minutes, Angela and I talked terms and conditions. She had no problem exceeding the salary and benefits I was receiving at the factory. If things didn't work out, I could always come back. Actually, I didn't want to come back. I wanted things to work out. Todd wasn't looking so good when we got back downstairs. Too many hot dogs and too many sodas. Terry, on the other hand, was having a great time. He seemed to spend more time talking to Carla than looking at the cars. It was certainly a good sign. Todd threw up in the truck on the way home and skipped dinner. I started work that Monday. Things went exactly as Angela predicted they would. I was surprised at how quickly I was able to familiarize myself with the operation. I approached some of the employees and soon had eyes and ears in the plant. The one in the blue shirt, who gave me a big smile on the first day, was Glenn's cousin, my biggest supporter. Most of the employees wanted the business to prosper and were more than willing to rat out the bad apples. Angela let me handle the layoffs, and I found I liked it. I was living up to my reputation. Detective Green came by several times for coffee, but the conversation was usually light and friendly. I finally got him to open up a bit. Three years ago, I was a cop in Philadelphia. I came home one day to find my wife in bed with my supervisor. I beat the crap out of him on the spot and kicked my wife out. The police department gave me a choice between resigning or being fired. A week later, I had a job here. Before I left, I made sure the son of a bitch who was banging my wife left too. I did not ask him for more information. It was his business. At least I understood why he seemed to be leaning on my side. The boys agreed not to mention my new job to their mother on visiting days. They made a few comments about the long drive, but seemed to understand that there was no escape. I felt it was important for Marcy to see her children, not for their sake, but to allow me to rub salt in the wounds. I know, I know. It's a horrible way to use your children, but it gave me petty pleasure. Angela and I were spending more time together, at work and after work. One weekend, the boys insisted that I take her and Carla to Noble's Grove. Most of the time, we stayed closer to home. Living together seemed to complicate any possibility of romance. I was interested in having a closer relationship with Angela, but it wasn't convenient. 
I was still living at my parents' house with the kids and Angela and Carla had a small studio apartment. As business was going much better than expected, Angela started talking about looking for a house to buy. She spent a lot of time on the computer looking for the perfect one. My first wake-up call was when she explained why she wanted a four-bedroom house. Danny, I think it's important that the kids each have their own room. It's better to take care of those things now than to have to do it again later, don't you agree? Of course, I quickly realized that the question was a trick. I also realized that Angela felt I was more than just an employee. The potential for romance was looking better. Yes, I think that's a great idea. I also think a split bedroom plan would be a good thing to consider. I don't like the idea of them being too close to the master bedroom. I walked out of the office right after I said that and noticed a small smile on his face. It was a strange relationship. We had never had sex. We hadn't even come close to it. We hadn't even kissed. But I felt closer to her than I had to Marcy in 12 years. Two days later, when my divorce from Marcy was final, we all went to Red Lobster to celebrate. The kids didn't know the reason for the party, but Angela did. Later, back at the apartment, the kids were watching a pay-for-view movie when Angela cornered me in the kitchen and stood on tiptoe to kiss me. We were hugging and laughing a little when Carla came into the room. Oops, sorry, Mom. As she turned to leave, she added, It's about time. When we got back to the living room, Carla was whispering in Terry's ear and they were both smiling. Angela and I were on our best behavior for the rest of the night, but I was looking forward to whatever it was. The next day, while the kids were at school, Angela and I took a long lunch and went back to the apartment. We both had a lot of energy to burn. We didn't get back to work until just before quitting time. There were many long lunches after that, and Angela began to get serious about looking for a house. Detective Green came to see us regularly, mostly just to chat, but occasionally he would stare at cars. He fell in love with a Studebaker Hawk that had been owned by Roger Ebert, the movie critic. Angela gave him a good price. Danny, I need you to take me to see Marcy. It was an unexpected request. The boys and I took fewer trips than we used to, but Marcy never seemed to complain. Any particular reason? Closure. I need closure. I never understood what it meant. I knew all the words that described it, but the concept seemed to escape me. Do you want me to come with you? Just take me over there. You don't have to be with me when I talk to her. It was a warm, sunny autumn day when we arrived at Muncie. Prisoner visits were being held outside, so I parked by the fence. Ten minutes later, Marcy and Angela came out to the exercise yard and sat at one of the tables. They were both chatting and smiling, as if they were long-lost friends. Things got interesting after five minutes. The smile had disappeared from Marcy's face. She was now leaning over the picnic table and scowling at her visitor. Angela, on the other hand, still looked happy. Suddenly, Marcy pounced on the table and tried to grab her. The interruption was quickly squashed by several of the guards as they led my ex-wife back into the building, kicking and screaming. Angela turned, looked at me, smiled, and shrugged her shoulders before leaving the visiting area. She was still smiling when she returned to the car. What the hell was that all about? Your ex-wife sure is a touchy bitch. Angela seemed to chuckle to herself. We drove for several miles, and then she turned slightly, straining against the seatbelt. I introduced myself, and she seemed glad to see me. Everything was fine as long as she thought I was on her side. I admit I fooled her a little at first. What do you mean? I told her I was coming from Baltimore to get revenge. That seemed to cheer her up because she thought I meant you. Of course, all I really meant was that I was going to get even with Tony by taking over his business. I guess you can still get revenge on a dead person, can't you? Okay, but why did he get so angry? He wanted details like when, where, and how. Of course I knew he meant you. Now I was getting interested. I told her it was going to take a long, long time and asked if she wanted me to keep her informed of the progress. She enthusiastically agreed and insisted on knowing exactly how I planned to do it. When I told her how I was going to do it, she got mad. She flipped out. She went nuts. It was great. Okay? Okay. How the hell are you going to kill me? Okay. How the hell are you going to kill me? Now I want to know. Her smile grew bigger. I told him I was going to screw you to death. That was it? Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? I thought he might get pissed off, but I never expected it to happen. Everything was silent for a few moments. We were both smiling. I was very proud of her. When do you plan to start this round? As soon as we get to the next motel, dummy. Two months later, Angela and I got married. It was a small ceremony in the backyard of our new house. Angela sent Marcy a wedding invitation with a little note inside. Everything is going according to plan. He should be dead in 40 or 50 years.